Oxalates are probably the biggest plant toxin of them all, the most concerning. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Meek Medic Podcast. Now, today's episode, we are discussing plant toxins and that very popular soundbite from Dr. Anthony Chafee, plants are trying to kill you. Now, I don't want to put words into his mouth, but I think Dr. Chafee would agree, and I'm fairly certain he said this before, that no, he doesn't actually believe that plants are trying to actively kill off the human species. And no, they aren't collecting weapons and practicing guerrilla warfare training or anything of that like. Now, what he means is plants have toxins, and these may be a concern to human beings. Let's explore this idea and delve a little bit into some research. As always, I'll be putting links in the episode description to all of the resources I'm using so you can check those out yourself. First off though, if you haven't seen my episode on oxalates, episode 56, you really should check that out. It's gonna be really, really good for you. Oxalates are probably the biggest plant toxin of them all, the most concerning. I want to start off with a quick definition first though. What is a toxin? A toxin is a harmful substance produced by a living organism, whether that is an animal, a plant, or a bacteria. And it has the ability to cause damage or a deleterious or harmful effect. They can have a range of effects on the human body, such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramps, or they can be deadly, of course. Toxins can enter the body through a variety of mechanisms through inhalation, so airborne, uh, swallowing, ingestion, fluid, food, you name it. They interfere with normal cellular processes and can damage DNA and proteins within the body. Here are some examples of common toxins. Botulinum toxin, otherwise known as Botox, a potentially fatal form of food poisoning. Ricin, most of us probably know about ricin. This is produced from the castor bean plant. Ricin is a highly potent toxin, incredibly dangerous. Tetrodotoxin, found in puffer fish and other marine animals. Tetrodotoxin is a neurotoxin that can cause paralysis and death. Aflatoxin, probably a lot of us have heard of this, produced by a type of mold, commonly found in uh, coffee, for example. Cyanide, again, I'm sure we've all heard of this, found in some plants and produced by certain bacteria, quite common in almonds and bitter almonds, peach pits. Of course, that's just a very, very short list of potential toxins. There are hundreds, if not thousands more. But the point here, a toxin is something that gets into our bodies and can cause harmful and negative effects. Why do plants have toxins? Animals can produce toxins, such as Botox, for example, as we already mentioned. But, well, I'm not sure bacteria really count as animals in this case, but you know what I mean. There's a few animals, of course, out there like snakes that create venom, which is, of course, toxic. But for the most part, animals don't have toxins actually within their flesh themselves. That's because animals have kinetic defense. We can run away, we can kick, we can bite, we can scream and do all the rest of it. Plants don't have that ability. If something wants to kill a plant, the plant has to kind of just sit there and take it. If something wants to eat it, it can't really do much. That's not really good for the plant. No living organism actually wants to die. They want to be alive, they want to reproduce. Now, you could maybe argue that fruit of plants wants to, wants to be eaten, but that's a slightly different story. So what can plants do to defend themselves? Well, they don't have kinetic defense. They have chemical defenses. And this means they have to have those toxins to defend themselves because they can't run away. They can't kick. They can't bite. Although they do scream, they have these chemical defenses to protect themselves because they don't want to die. The idea that plants have toxins is actually surprisingly alien to a lot of people. And I really don't understand why, because we know we can't just go into the forest and eat you know, like random bushes and random berries, things off the ground. I mean, hopefully most of us know, know that by now. Usually when I'm talking to patients about this though, there is a kind of a light bulb moment where I'm talking about this and they're like, oh yeah, actually, no, I can't just like go off and eat random stuff in the forest. Oh, maybe plants actually do have toxins. So are all plants toxic? No. Well, yes, actually. Some of them are incredibly toxic, like deadly nightshade, for example, many you know, species of mushrooms. And what about other plants? All plants have toxins in them, every single plant. What changes is how deadly they are to us, but every single plant has toxins in them. This is their way of defending themselves. Nothing wants to die. Even your harmless little lettuce, for example, has toxins. These are natural pesticides, natural herbicides, natural fungicides that are there to protect the plant. Even to the point where numerous studies by like the EPA, the EFSA, for example, are talking about glyphosate, saying that it's not that bad because the natural pesticides in the plants are worse in some cases. So all plants are toxic, but the toxic level differs. The toxicity differs. 
Where are the toxins located though? Toxins are located throughout the plant, but according to most sources that I could find, the predominant location for the toxins is in the skin and the seeds. This actually makes a lot of sense when you consider it because the first thing that an animal, an insect, anything like that is going to eat is, well, basically the outside. It's the skin that they're going to eat first. So that makes sense to put a lot of toxins there. After that, though, you really don't want your babies to die. You really don't want your babies to die. And those are the seeds, the pips. So it makes sense that we're going to put a lot of toxins in these areas as well. I mean, what living organism out there in the world does not want to protect its babies? So this is why we see a large concentration of toxins in the skin and in the seeds. Now, we're talking about toxins because they're dangerous, but do toxins actually have any benefits? Obviously, look, they're toxins, they're harmful, but they might have some potential benefits. If we look at this paper, and I've referenced this before on the podcast, again, if you were listening in the car or anything, I'm going to put it in the episode description. It's this, uh, if you Google it, it, I'll put the link anyway, but anti-nutrients, friends or foe, you're going to find it. Now, I'm not going to read this whole article. I've been through it before, but it's suggested that there's things, some toxins like lectins and oxalates might have antibacterial properties, for example. However, I would personally prefer to avoid these because, well, I mean, they're toxins at the end of the day. On a plant-based diet, of course, you're going to get loads of these toxins, but on an animal-based or a carnivore diet, you're really not going to get any of these. But what toxins do we need to be concerned with? I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands of toxins, but the big ones as I see it are oxalates, lectins, phytates, goitrogens, and endocrine disruptors. Those are my top five in, I think, reducing order. There's loads of others, of course. I'm sure the comments on YouTube, people are going to be typing away all these other toxins, of course, but these are my top five toxins to be concerned about. Let's talk about some individual toxins now. So the first thing I want to start with is oxalates. As I've said, I've covered this in episode 56, so you guys definitely should check that one out to make sure that you've seen that one. Oxalates are naturally occurring compounds within plants, including leafy green vegetables and things like spinach, particularly some fruits, nuts, and seeds. They're also produced in the human body, actually, as a byproduct of of metabolism and stress. The higher the stress, the more you're going to produce. Oxalates combined to minerals such as iron, zinc, and magnesium make them, them less available for absorption to the body. This can lead to problems like malabsorption, iron deficiency, magnesium deficiency, cramps, and so on. It might also lead to osteoporosis, and of course, calcium oxalate is the biggest form of kidney stones. Oxalates are definitely associated with urinary tract issues, including, of course, kidney stones. Also potentially implicated in things like hypothyroidism and conditions like breast cancer, for example. Again, I'm just going to bring up the paper here showing, again, the link here with oxalate and breast cancer. They're also potentially linked with things like autism and ADHD as well. Now, oxalates are quite a tricky thing. And in my opinion, they are the worst because they are hugely prevalent in many, many, many plants, especially the ones that we are told that are good for us like spinach, chard, sweet potato, avocados, olives, but also really high in things like cereals and grains, again, that we're told to eat, you know, chocolate bars, dark chocolate, high in oxalates, granola, all these things. And despite popular opinion, they are pretty much not destroyed or denatured by cooking. The only way to detoxify oxalates is to soak the plants in water, or to cook them in water. This will cause the oxalates to leach out into the water, therefore detoxifying the plant. But you can only reduce the toxins by so much. You're not gonna get every single bit of toxin out of the plant. You can't get rid of all of these oxalates. The longer you soak it for, the more it's gonna reduce. But you're only gonna maybe get about 50% out at most into the water that you're cooking it in or soaking it in, assuming that you then go and discard that. If you say put spinach into cream, try making a spinach, you know, sort soup, for example, I don't know why you'd want a spinach soup, but if you do want a spinach soup, you're actually not going to get rid of any oxalates because whatever leaches out is going to be in the cream anyway. Cooking might actually make oxalates worse as well by breaking apart those cells, which is just obviously even worse for us. How many people though really are actually soaking their food? Like potatoes, for example, they're making some fries. How many are going to soak them like from morning till night, even for two or three days? I actually remember cooking, used to be cooking with my mum, and she actually used to do this. She used to cut the potatoes in the morning, peel them and cut them and then put them in water for the rest of the day in the fridge. I never understood why. Maybe she she <laughs> knew something about oxalates. Although to be fair, when I told her tea was really high in oxalates, she kind of cried uh, her little English heart out. I think I broke her English heart with that one. So 
Sorry, mum. Let's talk about lectins now. Okay, so lectins are a diverse family of carbohydrate binding proteins found in all plants and animals. They play a variety of roles in living organisms, including defense against herbivores and other pathogens, cell adhesion and nutrient transport. However, some lectins can be toxic to human beings and other animals. It is suggested that lectins may have a beneficial effect in humans, such as helping to identify pathogens and kind of mark them for destruction. But I haven't seen any really good evidence that that actually happens or really is in any way beneficial rather than simply just not consuming lectins at all. I think if consuming lectins were essential for our immune system, then pretty much all carnivores would basically just be dead from infection. But in fact, quite the opposite is usually seen with carnivores, at least anecdotally, that people report very rarely getting sick. In, in actual fact, having carnivore patients is pretty bad for, for my business because they never really get sick and they never have to come in. But, you know, I slightly digress. Uh, human beings actually do produce some lectins and these probably do play a role in our immune system, such as selectins. Now, these lectins are involved in cell adhesion and immune response. They play a role in the recruitment of immune cells to sites of inflammation and infection. Galectins. These lectins are involved in cell growth, differentiation, and apoptosis. They also play a role in the modulation of immune responses. Siglex. These lectins are involved in cell signaling and recognition of self and non-self antigens. They play a role in various processes, including immune regulation, pathogen recognition, and cell adhesion. C-type lectins. These lectins are involved in a variety of functions, including immune recognition, pathogen clearance, and cell-cell interactions. They play a role in various processes, including innate immunity, adaptive immunity, and development. What are the big offenders in lectins and what issues can they cause? Well, the biggest offenders are typically beans, legumes, grains, and seeds, but they can be also quite high in nightshade vegetables like potatoes as well. They tend to cause a lot of GI symptoms, mainly like diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, bloating, gas, leaky gut syndrome. Make sure you've checked that out, episode 62 on leaky gut syndrome if you want more on that one. Like oxalates, they can be reduced by soaking in water typically, and they will kind of slowly leach out. And this is why kidney beans actually come in water because I guess, well, people are just stupid and they may not cook them properly and then they're gonna get sick and die. But unlike oxalates, they can actually be quite significantly reduced down by cooking. This is why we're told to cook our kidney beans properly, not just slow cook them. That's because oxalates are really kind of living crystals or not living crystals, sorry, whereas lectins are proteins, so they get denatured with heat. Denatured proteins are less biologically active or may be completely destroyed or inactivated by cooking. The longer they are cooked for and the higher the heat, the more they will denature. This is why we are advised to cook the, the kidney beans, as I've said, and not to slow cook them. Lectins and oxalates tend to go hand in hand. And if you remove grains, cereals, seeds, nuts, legumes, beans, you're going to be re removing a large chunk of toxins. Okay, let's talk about phytates now. Phytates, also known as inositol hexakisphosphate, or IP6 for short, are naturally occurring compounds found in plant seeds, including cereals, legumes, nuts, and seeds. You guys are probably getting the theme here. They are the primary storage of form of phosphorus in these plants, and they play a role in seed germination and plant growth. The complex structure of these phytates allows them to bind to various minerals, including calcium, iron, zinc, and magnesium, which of course, understandably, when consumed, has the ability to bind to these minerals and having negative consequences for our health. Again, a leading cause of quote-unquote malabsorption or mineral deficiencies and osteoporosis. So like with oxalates and lectins, soaking and sprouting in this case can reduce phytate content of food by maybe 25 to 50%. And like lectins, cooking this probably reduces phytate loads by about 40%. Adding vitamin C to phytates may help ameliorate, that means remove or reduce iron binding, for example, but excess vitamin C can lead to oxalate production, so that's a bit of a catch-22. Common sources of phytates include, you pretty much guessed it, the same as lectins and oxalates. Seeds, grains, beans, legumes. Those are the most part with cereals as well. This is why I'm not a fan of diets like paleo that have a large amount of these toxins still in them. Let's talk about goitrogens now. 
Goitrogens are naturally occurring substances found in many leafy green vegetables, for example, cruciferous vegetables and some fruits. They can interfere with the thyroid gland's ability to produce thyroid hormones, which of course is pretty bad for us, and it can lead to enlargement of the thyroid, also known as a goiter. There are three main types of goitrogens. Goitrins, these are found in cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, and turnips. Thiocyanates, these are found in cassava, a starchy root vegetable that is a staple food in many parts of the world. Flavonoids, these are found in a variety of fruits and vegetables, including apples, berries, and grapes. Goitrogens interfere with the thyroid's ability to produce thyroid hormones by blocking the uptake of iodine, a mineral that is essential for thyroid hormone production. When the thyroid gland produces too few thyroid hormones, it can enlarge in an attempt to compensate for the deficiency. This is called a goiter. Factors that increase the risk of goiter include a lack of iodine. Iodine deficiency is a key component of hypothyroidism. Excess iodine actually can also cause hyperthyroidism, very interestingly. I did have a patient who actually did have that happen to them because they were taking excess iodine and they were told to stop and it actually normalized. Certain medical conditions as well, like Graves' disease, Hashimoto's, these autoimmune thyroiditis. Of course, if you've got any other malabsorption, that's going to increase the risk of iodine deficiency as well. And there's probably some genetic component here as well. Some people are just going to be predisposed to having this happen. Doesn't mean they're going to get thyroid problems. It's akin to the genetics loading the gun, but the environment then pulling the trigger. Now, like the other toxins, you can reduce these goitrogens by cooking, soaking and sprouting, or you could increase the iodine intake in your diet to counteract this, but it's not going to detoxify the goitrogens. It's just going to kind of try and compensate a little bit for it. Not my preference. I'd rather just not eat them in the first place. Endocrine disruptors. That's the last one I want to talk about today. Endocrine disruptors. Fairly straightforward. Endocrine disruptors, EDCs, are toxins that can interfere with the normal functioning of the endocrine system which is responsible for producing and regulating hormones. As we know, hormones are incredibly important in the human body and regulate pretty much all of our body functions, including growth and development, reproduction, most of our nervous system, and mood. EDCs can disrupt these functions by making or blocking the effects of natural hormones or by altering their production or breakdown. Endocrine disruptors come in many forms, for example, chemicals, plastics, industrial chemicals, microplastics, even some synthetic clothing is thought to maybe contain things like BPA, which can act as an endocrine disruptor as well. For the purposes of this talk though, we're gonna focus on the plant toxins. The big plant endocrine disruptor or PEDs are phytoestrogens, saponins and goitrogens. We spoke about goitrogens already, so let's have a look at phytoestrogens and saponins. Phytoestrogens are plant chemicals with a similar structure to estrogen, but make no mistake, these are not estrogen. Sorry, ladies, they are not estrogen. Weirdly, though, they can mimic estrogen, and so they can have estrogenic effects, but they can also block estrogen receptors either temporarily or permanently. They can also permanently activate estrogen receptors as well. So we have to be extremely careful with these. The most common plant that contains this is soy. Sometimes other innocuous things like broccoli, for example, can have quite high levels as well. Saponins are the equivalent, but for testosterone, again, typically acting as disruptors. So don't eat saponins thinking you're gonna get a boatload of testosterone. You're probably not going to. And in fact, most likely your testosterone is going to go down. Just like everything else though, common sources, endocrine disruptors, you guessed it, Legumes, beans, seeds, grains. Green leafy vegetables and even some fruits potentially like apples and grapes are quite high in saponins as well. Again, just like everything else, cooking and soaking can help to avoid these toxins, but you're not gonna completely get rid of them. The best way to detoxify them is just don't eat them in the first place. So there we have it. In my opinion, the top five plant toxins that we need to be concerned about mostly coming from seeds, nuts, grains, and legumes. Of course, other things with oxalates like spinach, rhubarb, chard, beetroot, and raspberries, potatoes also very high there. Obviously there's other plant toxins as well, but these are really just the top five. In my experience, my opinion with patients and myself, I don't think the other ones make as much of a difference, but I personally would rather just get rid of pretty much all the toxins I could. Thank you guys for listening to this episode of the Meat Medic Podcast. Make sure you check out my episode on oxalates if you haven't seen that already. And also make sure you check out my episode on eating bugs because these contain quite a lot of toxins as well. 
As always, make sure you follow me on social media at The Meat Medic across all major channels. A like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube would be absolutely amazing, especially as I'm about to hit 10,000 subscribers on YouTube, and I really would like to push it over into those five digits if I can. Thank you, guys. I'll see you in the next episode.